Hello, this is Nadia Jenkins Johnston. I am the senior conference producer for events at wealthmanagement.com, specifically focusing on inside ETFs, wealth stack, and retirement income edge. I am happy to welcome you to the Inside ETFs podcast. Welcome to the Inside ETFs podcast. I am honored to be joined today by Shayna Sissel, who is colloquially known as the queen of alts, but more officially as the founder, president, and chief, ex chief executive officer of Banrian Capital Management. We are colleagues, but also friends. And so I am excited to talk a little bit about Inside ETFs as it will be featured on the uh, wealth Management Edge Stage in 2024, but also to dive deep into Shana's particular expertise on the new frontier of all things allocation and investments. Welcome, Shana. I'm very excited to be your very first guest. It's an <laughs> honor to be here. I am thrilled that our audience gets to hear a little bit about what we often discuss um, on our own over over Mexican corn and and tortillas. So this is really exciting. <laughs> Our shared love of elotes. <laughs> Absolutely. Shane, I always like to start start out by giving the audience an opportunity to hear more about what you do and what um, sort of moves the needle for you in terms of what you're passionate about. I know you have lots of media presence, right? I know that you just recently did a spot for Fox News and that you are the host of many podcasts, but specifically for the, the newest, I believe, you're doing it alt wrong. So can you tell us... <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that and a little bit more about your media presence and how you're able to pull it all off. <laughs> uh, do I pull it all off? Uh, sometimes I wonder. No, seriously, um, I founded my firm Bonner and Capital Management a little over a year ago with the express purpose of helping advisors learn how to allocate and scale uh, allocations to alternative investments. And that is actually where my passion lies. I was introduced to the world of alts in 2007, which is kind of ironic because you would think that given everything that happened, um, I, right. <laughs> I would uh, have been terrified of the alts world. But actually, it was that experience through that difficult time that made me really passionate about why everybody should have alts in their portfolio. And, and, and then it also happened to be a time in history where alts became incredibly available. Uh, because there were changes to the 40 Act that made liquid alts possible. And uh, the proliferation of liquid alts happened shortly thereafter. So it's just where my passion lies. It's something I think comes across in everything I do. Um, and hopefully advisors and their clients look at the media presence and the work that I've done and think, this is somebody I want to work with and I want to understand her passion for this and you know learn more. Uh, so that's kind of where it all stems from. Yes, I'm on TV a lot. That is also something that started during the financial crisis, ironically enough. I don't think people are aware that I've been doing media since 2008. Um, I think most people just have seen me in the last you know, five years um, when I started doing media again. Uh, more prominently, uh, but um, I've been doing media for an, a very, very long time. I used to joke that during the financial crisis, I was on TV every single day, multiple times a day, <laughs> um, because I was the economic expert for the Boston ABC affiliate. And they would literally come into my living room and interview me because there was some market event, uh, or I would go into their studios and do the six o'clock and then record something for the 11 o'clock. It was crazy, but media has become an important part of my brand and just being able right. to get myself out there. I had a, a, a boss tell me that I should really focus on building my personal brand. And so as um, self-interested as it may seem at times, uh, it was an important step that I took to start to reflect who I am authentically and, and what makes me tick and the passion that I have in this alternative space 
and really build that brand over time, which is how we became friends is, you know, people telling you about me because they connected with me usually on social media or saw me uh, speak at another conference. And so that's how we were connected. It was the, the work I did there. So, you know, those are the things that make me tick. Those are the things I'm passionate about. On a more personal level, as we've covered, I happen to have a deep passion for elotes, particularly <laughs> the the kind of the, the corn salad that's not on the cob. Uh, it's easier to eat uh, and there's typically more of it. You know, that's great. But I also have a lot of passion for my family. I, I have an eight year old son. I am passionate about empowering my employees uh, and empowering women in finance and then lastly, and you know, probably the most superficial of all, I have to really enjoy the ocean. Uh, so you'll often find me traveling anywhere that I can get near the coastline, which, you know, as it turns out, Inside ETFs is perfect for that. Exactly. And we made sure to have that for you, Shana, because... <laughs> it, 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 we, it is, of course, for me. Of, of, of course. Um, of if, course. If, for those of you who are just learning, right, uh, sh- relationships are, are are really important to me, but are the core, I think, um, of everything all of us do. And therefore, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be both colleagues, but and 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 also friends. If you've seen Shana on stage and seen our work together, you'd remember that not only has she been featured in um, places like Fox, Fox News, as I, as I mentioned, the Money Show, Women in Asset Management Summit, but also uh, on the Inside ETFs and Wealthstack stage starting from maybe 2019 and was also on stage really leading conversations about active ETFs, really active management in general in 2023. For 2024, I took some of those conversations really to heart as I started to work on the agenda for our upcoming conference. And so I think this is a great opportunity to sort of give a background view into the vision that uh, helps to create what you see in panels uh, throughout the conference. So these conversations that we've had really uh, delve into uh where have we been traditionally in asset allocation, uh, but also where where does asset allocation need to evolve into in order to see growth? What I love about Shana is that she's able to speak to missed opportunities that maybe some of us are looking back at and saying, I wish I had known that in 2008 and 2009. I heard it in 2007. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, Shana, if you could uh, give us some enlightenment, some enlightenment on where you think uh, traditional asset allocation is going and where uh, where it's been in 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 general. So take us through some of that history. So I think when it comes to asset allocation, we're all very familiar, and we've probably beat this to death at this point with the uh, concept of 60 40 is it dead is it not <laughs> um I, I i think that what we have to remember is when 60 40 became sort of the commonplace your only options were to actually buy physical stocks and physical bonds there were no mutual funds there were no etfs and that world has evolved so the original 60 40 if you go back I don't even know if 6040 was really a thing in the like 40s and 50s because fixed income was not necessarily accessible to the average investor because there were no fixed income mutual funds. There were just individual bonds you had to buy. Uh, so that meant you need to have a broker. And, and, and so things evolve. And I think we have to look at allocating in our portfolios in the same way. The world and the availability of different types of investment strategies is substantially different even than it was 10 years ago. As I pointed out earlier, liquid alts did not exist really until 2009. The legislation that changed everything was happened in 2007, but you didn't really see the proliferation until 2009, and that's because people performance chased and those types of alternative products did really well during the financial crisis. And so there was a lot of new product brought to the market 
And, but today we have ETFs everywhere. It, it, during the financial crisis, ETFs were not as plentiful as they are today. You know, you had SPY and you were just starting to see ETFs become a thing. And right. th that has evolved. So I think when we talk about allocating our client portfolios, we have to keep in mind that, you know, we have a lot more tools in the toolkit to use today than we did even 10 years ago. And so we should evolve accordingly. And that's why I feel very strongly, and that's why I started Bonrian, that we need to start changing the playbook and providing the education necessary so that we can take advantage of all the tools that we have available for our toolkit. I think that it's it's one of the one of the key uh, memories from our very first call for me was the fact that you were able to tell a story that was easy and palatable for the audience to understand why things need to evolve. And you've just done that with the conversation around 6040. We've talked this, you are correct, to death. But one of the conversations um, that we don't always touch on is why the 60-40 the split um, is something that's standard today. And I think that that's really key for understanding why it needs to change. So what I would ask perhaps next, and as a, as a piggyback to, to my first question, is if we're talking about evolution and we're talking about growth, we also um, think about evolution from the standpoint of uh, weeding out weaknesses, growing with new opportunities, right? So give me an example, maybe it's maybe it's in the alt space, maybe it's it's in some other area of allocation where you feel like a weakness has been uh, essentially highlighted through market history that new ways of investing can address. Yeah, so I want to start by just giving the base case for why the 6040 became so popular again um, was that if you think about the technology, the tech bubble, um, it was following the tech bubble that all of a sudden everybody remembered bonds were a thing. I like to often t remind people that PIMCO, the behemoth of bond investing, did not become PIMCO until after the financial crisis. If you look, PIMCO was founded in the 80s, mm -hmm. but Bill Gross and the popularity of his products did not you know, exponentially explode until after the tech bubble because people remembered and looked back in hindsight and said, if I had had bonds in my portfolio and I had rebalanced with some regularity, I could have avoided all the, these large losses. And it was that looking in hindsight that people really started to realize, oh, we should be doing this 60-40 thing uh, more. Uh, and, and I think that this is the first opportunity we've had to look in hindsight about what would happen if you actually allocated something to the alternative space. As I said before, alternative investments at scale were not available prior to the financial crisis. In fact, they didn't actually evolve and become readily available until after the financial crisis was really over. So it's really hard to look back and say, well, if I had had that in my portfolio back then, I would have been better off. You don't have any history to work with. Right. You can try to come up with some historical framework basing it on private funds, but I don't think that's a realistic way to look at it. And I don't think that the average investor will buy that because it wouldn't have been available to them. So that's a little bit different than looking back in hindsight on the fixed income thing, because as I stated, PIMCO was founded in the 80s. And so there were actually in the 90s bond funds available, just people didn't use them. So you can actually look back and, and have that, some framework. You can't do that with else. Right. 2022 <laughs> was really the first opportunity we had to look in real time and see what would have happened if you had included alts. And I think what we're seeing is that people are realizing that, oh, wait, there's a benefit here. The diversifying benefit and this for, you're starting to hear the more nuanced view of alternatives which i think is really important 
because for the longest time, alts were just a thing people couldn't access. The regular person couldn't access alts. Those were the things for rich people, the hedge funds, the private equity and private credit. And those are what became alts and went into the alts bucket. But Mm -hmm. the conversation is becoming far more nuanced where many of my peers are readily saying private equity isn't really alts. It's really equity. It's just equity in a slightly different wrapper with a better transfer excess return because less efficient markets, but it's still equity and private credit is still credit. So are they really alts? And that's a new debate that we're having Mm -hmm. is how to actually look at alts in a more nuanced way. The benefit that you get from alts is not from the private equity and the private credit. It's from more of the hedge fund type strategies, which are quite frankly, the scariest because they feel the most complicated. It's easy to understand private equity and private credit because as I pointed out, they're just equity and credit in a less liquid wrapper, but they're the same basic concepts. But when you start looking at things like global macro and managed futures and equity market neutral and arbitrage strategies, you're talking about complexity. Mm -hmm. And people get scared of the things that are complex. But I think continuing to have these conversations and continuing to highlight the diversification benefits will help to educate the uh, you know broader investment world on this opportunity to really evolve the way that we allocate portfolios and continue to to focus on what we have always been focusing on which is diversification is king you know michael kitches put out a linkedin post about a year ago and it was so powerful that i remember it to this day And uh, it was just one like meme graphic, but it was so powerful because it was so right. He said, true diversification means always having to say you're sorry. (laughs) And it just stuck with me because he's totally right. Because if you're truly diversified, there's always something that's not working. And I think that's always been the difficulty with alts is that they always perform really differently from the markets that people follow and their complexity makes people scared. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the more we can open the conversation and make it less scary, I think the better off we'll be as we look to evolve the way that we allocate portfolios. Right. It's, it's interesting. You, you answered the question from the basis of, of not just the, the question of 2020, 2020 vision, right? Like when we look back into hindsight, Uh, We look back with hindsight, uh, are we able to see opportunities that we missed? But you also hinted towards um, some some places where alts really provide strength. So that's part of the evolution of allocation, right? And you so it sounds to me like that diversification is that strength, which makes perfect sense for uh, even for 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 the. the, you know, sort of king of, of investments, uh, media knowledge, Michael Kitches, it, it, it is, it's incredible to hear someone like him say that we're always going to be learning something. We're always going to be regretting perhaps a decision because it's part of learning. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm interested as we are sort of on this learning journey define for us what you consider to be alts at this time what do you consider to be maybe top five in that bucket and when are alternative investments really alternative investments so alternative investments are still considered more by what they aren't than what they are Mm -hmm. so we continue to find alternative investments as Anything that's not public equities or public credit, public fixed income, that is the traditional definition, which, as you can tell, is is more of an exclusionary than inclusionary approach, um, which is one of the ways that, you know, one of the other topics du jour of a few years ago was always explained was in the ESG space. I think that's changing. Um, And as I said, my peers are having more nuanced conversations about public equity versus private equity and private credit versus public credit. 
And I, I, I think that right now the definition still remains anything that's not publicly traded equity or fixed income. But to your point, is it truly alternative? And I would argue that the true alternatives are actually the things that are uncorrelated or low correlation. That's the stuff that you want to allocate to actively in an alternative allocation or a non-core allocation to your portfolio. Those are the things that actually are pretty accessible in liquid alternative form. Although I would argue you can get better exposure and better diversification by being willing to have a little less liquidity. Most mm. hedge funds are actually fairly liquid. You know, they they may not be daily liquid, but they're typically weekly or monthly. It's not like, oh my God, you're locking your, your money up like you do in private equity and private credit. So, you know, I think that people need to be open-minded to that. But with that comes complexity because in order to get that diversification benefits, you're doing something really outside of the box. Mm -hmm. It may be that you're just doing something a little nuanced by trading in public markets. So I mentioned market neutral. That's just the idea of being long and short in equal measures, typically in equities. And there's typically some reason to be long one thing and short another thing. And basically you make money as long as the thing you're long is down less than the thing you're short. Um, so you can have everything go down and still get a positive return. That's that's what provides you that diversification benefit is the fact that you are doing something that takes beta out of the discussion um, right. because you have beta zero by right. doing that approach. Um, so that's the diversification. Managed futures is similar. You know, managed futures and CTAs are highly complex. They're dealing in a lot of commodity contracts, you know, oftentimes currency. Uh, global macro does that as well. Um, it can be complicated and managed futures almost always has low to no correlation with equities. And when equities are doing really well, managed futures tend not to. So if you think about the fact that the market goes up 70% plus of the time, that's that's not a great batting average. But, you know, a small allocation to something like that can provide such a diversification benefit where it doesn't really drag on your portfolio. But when things get really rough, it, it really can shine. And so we have to get comfortable with the conversation of the complexity and being able to set performance expectations and why they're there. If you think about it, no one ever complains when equities are up like 30%, but you got some bonds in your portfolio that are up four. Like <laughs> no one ever complains, right? But right. you will they do complain about it if it's an alt fund. And that just speaks to the lack of comfort <laughs> and the lack of knowledge. Because you could have an alt fund that actually is performing better than fixed income, but not as well as equities. But because it invests in equities, like a market neutral, they a client may ask a lot of questions and be upset with the performance because they just see it's investing in stocks. And again, that comes down to just continuing to educate. I think we're getting there and we will get there. But like anything, this takes a long time. time. And right. in order for people to be, gain comfort, it has to be really repetitive. It has to be in your face. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged by the fact that organizations like Inside ETFs is open-minded to doing more than one alt panel. There was a time when there were no alt panels and then there would be <laughs> one and it'd usually be during a breakout session. So like, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be center stage. But last year we had multiple alt panels at main stage. Yes. And I think that just speaks to the importance of being open-minded to what comes next. Yes. And I think that that's what Inside ETFs is really about, right? We have a name brand that we know and that we can um we can we can pin our uh connections, community and conversations to, right? We we get together at events to connect, but the ETF is just a wrapper. What we are really discussing at Inside ETFs, at e Inside ETFs, is what comes next. And so I'm interested, 
to ask a little bit, a little bit about what you think is coming next that maybe we're not really focusing on that that maybe is sort of the next best thing give us a little bit of a look into the crystal ball so i am still the queen of alts so (laughs) you're gonna get stuck with lots of answers that are alt related because that's my world i like it Um, (laughs) and it's not necessarily etf friendly but i don't think people are paying enough attention to what I think is going to be in the next five years, an explosion of interval funds. And I think that that's problematic because interval funds are really complicated. And I don't think people understand them that well. And I'm a little afraid that a lot of great products going to come to market and bomb because people just don't understand the structure. But interval funds to me are exciting because for the first time ever, just like in 2007, the first time ever, rules were allowed to give the average investor access to the types of strategies they never had access to before. Interval funds are going to do that for the average investor. It will now be possible for the average investor to actually invest in venture capital, to actually invest in private credit, to actually invest in private equity. And that is really game changing to me. The problem, as I stated, is interval funds are super complicated and their structure is such that they actually are far, they give the impression of liquidity, Mm -hmm. but it's not nearly as liquid as people are going to think it is. Right. And so that is my fear. We cannot change the fact that venture capital and private equity is an inherently illiquid form of investing. Exactly. And there's no way around that. The interval fund is allowing the average investor to access illiquid products. But I really fear the lack of education on the structure is going to lead to another BREIT situation, but in a larger (laughs) way and blow up a lot of product. So my hope is that we can get ahead of this. Right. Because it's exciting opportunity where true wealth can be built through these types of investment strategies. There's true opportunity for very strong excess returns that you could never get in the public markets. And that means that the average person will have access to the potential for that type of investing that until now was limited to millionaires and billionaires. I absolutely love this. I just really want to make sure that we're ahead enough of it that the interval fund and its beauty can be celebrated, but with caution for what the actual limitations of the product are. But I'm excited that it's going to provide access to an asset class that was never available to the average investor before. Well, you heard it first here. Um, if you if you if you have not been introduced to interval funds, which are you know closed end close a closed end a, a type of closed end fund, you you will be hearing more, and you will be really in a space to as an advisor promote greater diversity, right? But also an a more even playing field in terms of your clients being able to access this segment of the market in ways that they have not before. So I think, Shana, while you're right, anything new is a little bit scary. What we have, but that's good. That's the thing about interval funds. They're not necessarily brand new. They, They have existed before. I was not an interval fund fan when they initially came out because many of the products that were available in interval funds were products that didn't need to be in interval funds. <laughs> you know, they were products that had plenty of liquidity. Uh, you know, a lot of hedge funds converted to interval funds, kept the accredited investor hurdle, and were limiting liquidity when they had plenty of liquidity. What I'm seeing now, and I'm excited about, we actually have a, a new client we brought on that's actually launching an interval fund. I I can't go further than that. In the venture capital space, they, I can't tell you who the client is uh, for obvious reasons. It's in the quiet period. However, I'm hearing more and more of that. You know, we have 
plenty of venture capital firms that have come our way that want to work with us because they're going to be launching interval fund products. And those firms have no experience distributing to the advisor in the retail market. They have no experience. They've never dealt with that before. Right. So working with a firm like Bonrian, where our express purpose is to help advisors scale alternative investments. And part of our mission in doing that is we train our asset managers to exactly. do just that. Exactly. Um, which is, I think, an incredibly important part of what makes what we do so successful is that we make sure that the asset managers that we work with know how to work with advisors. And as these interval funds come to be, and we see venture capital interval funds, private credit interval funds, without the accredited investor hurdle, it becomes that much more important that we help create the connection between the two sides so that we have successful adoption, but also we don't see what happened when liquid alt funds came to market where it was super easy to get adoption initially, but all of a sudden, once the financial crisis was over and these funds performed how they were, should have performed, but we're not educating or working right. with advisors in the retail markets to set those expectations, uh, you know, now the liquid alt universe is substantially smaller than it was in 2009. Uh, and it's because products failed, not because they weren't good products, but because of the this gap between the asset manager and the retail market. Exactly. So we... We seek to bridge the gap mm -hmm. and hopefully have greater success as a result. But there are lots of private equity funds and venture capital funds that have reached out to us about upcoming interval product. And it's really exciting. And I think it's important that we get in front of it from the education standpoint, because the liquidity, the way the liquidity work in interval funds, and we won't go into it here because we could go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> but I do encourage anybody listening to like, heed my warning do I a little bit of more research to understand how the liquidity of those funds work exactly because your client is never going to be able to get 100 percent of their assets out of that thing at any time until or let me rephrase they will it will just take forever <laughs> and so the liquidity has some substantial limitations and you got to be prepared for that and I love that. I love that you are in a position and we are in a position together, right? Because of our, because we connect on what is important to teach, what is important to, or that it's important to teach, that it that it's important to educate. I love that you're able to give advisors who are not part of, of your, your direct sphere an opportunity to learn about what's next. And that's exactly what we'll be doing at Inside ETFs in May of 2024, still on the beach, exactly for Shana, and we know that. And uh, hopefully we might be able to bring some elote for her as well. So I hope that you will join us to enjoy all of the uh, conversations on active management, on uh, Bitcoin ETFs, on alternatives in general, and be in a better place to make smart decisions about allocation. This has been the Inside ETFs podcast. We're so happy that you joined us and can't wait to speak with you again. 